which is now in Steam Early Access, and uh, it is available, so the floor is yours. I had to have to ask, but uh, Spark Wi-Fi seems to be chugging along here. Is there a better Wi-Fi to connect to? That's all I've got. So like the downtown Wi-Fi, we don't know if that's good, bad, or different? Um, that which is wireless Ypsilanti? Yeah. You could try I'll it. Give it a go. Give it a shot. Because it's been trying to buffer a very small video file for a little while now. Is everybody streaming right now? Just a whole bunch of... Everybody just oh, yeah. disconnect. Yeah. Two minutes. Go. All right, I'm going to try wireless IPC. If not, uh, we've got lots of still image uh, that we can show off for it as well. Uh, my name's Scott Reschke. Hi, everybody. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. Oh. oh, hang on, i got to pretend. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, do not stream. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Listen, I was I was just in, in Belize, so and I, I showed I showed the um, there's a very reasonable charge for 50 megabyte internet service, seventeen hundred and fifty dollars per month. Um, it's Belizean, so it's just under nine hundred, you know, US. Uh, popular prices, well, we like them. Uh, so, oh, there you go. You look yeah. like you're. Uh, I think that came up a little better, yeah. Yeah, you look like you're rocking now. I'm just going through the buffer. Yeah. yeah, we'll give it a hot second. All right, so I own, I'm the CEO, lead creative designer, HR. Uh, I work with marketing with Emily. I do all the hiring and firing. I do project management, game design, level and props. I now have become quite good at lighting levels just because it turns out this will shock. Uh, is it okay if I swear? No. All right, good. Because uh, the Please later in the day it gets, the less the filters are there. So <laughs> Emily's going to roll her eyes. And everybody, this is Emily Springer. She is the marketing manager of the company. She does uh, daily streams. She does all the connects for stuff. And if afterwards you want to connect with us, uh, whether we can help you or you can help us, if there's any kind of connection, talk to me, talk to her. She makes sure I follow through on pretty much every email. She's not a secretary. She is more like my boss. Um, because when I tell her what to do, she doesn't do it. But when she tells me what to do, I have to do it. So um, she basically say, fear Emily. Fear Emily. Yes. So um, I started down the path of game design. I tried to do everything the hardest way possible the first time. Whereas Scott, he's not there anymore. Scott, there we go. Found him. Um, did everything. Honest to God, he is like the poster child of how you should get into game development. He started small. He got experience. He ramped up. He has a successful IP. Um, you know, he's maybe not a millionaire, but he will be. I guarantee it. Uh, I decided to go the hardest possible way because I know everything about everything. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s watching my father and my brother play Super Nintendo, Nintendo, uh, the Sega Genesis, all those lovely things. Many of you are probably too young to even know what a Sega Genesis even was. Um, and I wasn't so much of a gamer as I loved watching them play and figuring out what it was and why they'd play and help them with the puzzles and stuff. Uh, fast forward a lot of years, normally I tell this story a lot longer, but uh, usually it usually involves me having to drink some whiskey first, and I, I didn't see any provided, so, you know, you do what you do. Shame on me. Shame on Larry. And, um, but what I do love doing is working business and tackling challenges, and so that unfortunately made me an entrepreneur. Uh, I say that because uh, there is a certain something about working a day job and going home at 5 p.m. that seems very attractive to me, but I can't ever seem to do it. Uh, typically, business owners, he will tell you, he'll be the first to tell you after me, you go in at whatever, 7, 8, 9 in the morning, you're there till midnight, and then you do it, and you do it again, and you do it again, and you don't just do it for a week. Crunch time isn't just for two months for CEOs, it is for the entire development cycle. Uh, typically for the first year of, let's see, we gave, I gave the, the office their first vacation in two and a half years, uh, the first week of July. And now everybody did have some weekends off. But for me, it is, it's a very long road. And I'm telling you this, I'm not looking for a pity party. You know what, I love what I do. So I'm just warning you, if you're gonna get into owning, running a studio, he has been lucky as he deserved because of his diligence that he put into it. 
if at any point he had quit, then he would have been SOL. But he didn't, and that's why he has a successful series of titles. That quitting means sacrifice. It means endless amounts of hours. It means you never can stop or give up. Uh, my first business was a cyber cafe in East Lansing. It was called the Frag Center. I don't know if anybody ever gone to East Lansing uh, between 2003 and 2010, but I was right next to Chipotle. I was there before Chipotle was. Um, and I had 60 computers set up in a computer repair bay, and people would pay per hour to play video games there. So everybody got the concept of a cyber cafe here. All right, very good. And over the, what is that, about eight-ish years, that I had that, I had to learn what games people wanted to play, because originally, and publishers never cut cafes li uh, license deals. It was I had to pay 60 bucks for every single copy that I had installed on every one of the 60 computers, and it was expensive, and it was expensive, and I learned I was flushing thousands of dollars away because I buy games that nobody wanted to play. They were new, they were pretty, they had a great trailer, or they didn't, and so I learned over these years what attracted people to games. And then over those years, it became nothing but market research for me. I could see they love this about this game, they hate this about this game. I could, I, I predicted why Age of Conan, the MMO, was going to suck before it came out. And it was just based off of watching literally thousands of people play. We had logged something like 600,000 or 650,000 hours of game time over the years we were open. And so that's what I had originally made my game, my product model off of. I had started writing uh, the design for, now, I already said it, but does everybody know, has everybody in this room seen this name not in relation to my game before? Has everyone seen the flag for the state of Michigan? Go ahead. Is it everyone? Pretty much? Okay, this is the motto for the state of Michigan. It's Tuevor, it's Latin, it means I will defend. And uh, out of... Everyone I have talked to in the last three, no, because I started pitching this to investment in 2013, so in the last four years, um, I've only had three people accurately say the name and understand who it was from, and all of these people were from Michigan. So it was kind of... What? Yeah, it, it was, it's funny, but uh, I picked it because um, originally during the fundraising for this, I kept being told, go out west, go out east, go anywhere but Michigan. I didn't quite understand why originally, but I very much do now. In this room, is everyone here a game developer? Or are we all just... Uh, Spark, I'm sure, handles a lot of different IP or tech startups. We're all, we're all, we're all gamers. So this is all gamers tonight, good. So um, I'm sure you're all very good at what you do. And I'm sure most of you at some point have entertained the idea of not being in Michigan to do it. And that has become a serious problem for the infrastructure here because we don't have a lot of large established studios and so there is no flow of employment which is, he said, you are entirely distributed, correct? Sorry? Your, your studios are entirely yes, distributed? Yes, yeah, yeah. And it isn't because he doesn't want to hire local people. It's because it's so difficult hiring people that fit the job description simply because everybody just goes, ah, screw it, I'm going, some, I'm going to another studio, going out west. And so Tuevo, originally the name of this game, uh, it was going to be a top-down, uh, LOL had just launched, it was 08, and you know, Dota was real big, I'd watched Dota rise over a lot of years, and so when LOL came out I thought, well, I'm going to write some characters, do some stuff here and there, and so given that I find words are funny, I'd named it Raffle. Because everybody knows that Raffle is way funnier than Law, right? <laughs> Rise or Fall Legends. That was just the best title ever. Maybe I should have kept it. People would have understood what it meant more than Tuber. Is this a potato game? <laughs> um, we've had the bastardization of the name of the boar. Uh, and so we have inside the game, there's a little ragdoll physics, cloth physics, two-headed boar for the, the two boar. And if you've ever seen any of our Discord stuff, or listen to Emily's stream every now and then you're going to hear the boar provides. Well, a lot of our artists had come up with that little thing, and so it just became an inside joke. Um, but I stumped for cash for, let's see, I'm going to skip over a little bit. I quit my day job, uh, closed, so I closed the store since 08, 09 just completely killed us. Uh, 2010, I went back to college, got my business degree, uh, business administration. Ferris, any Ferris going on here? Ferris, you're great. Oh, you know what? I think you're right. Back there somewhere? Um, go Bulldogs. And uh, 
So I kind of thought, we're going to set this aside. I had two, three hundred pages of design documentation, but I was like, I'm never going to open a business again. That is just nightmarish. And then I had got into commercial insurance, and I hated it. Now, some people love commercial insurance. Man, that'll suck the soul right out of you. If you want the new IP for game, who wants to make it? It's the commercial insurance agent. And every day you have to try to not commit suicide. I mean, it's, it's kind of a taboo subject matter, but man, it was rough. And so I called up my grandmother. I was like, grandmother, she's uh, mid to late 80s. Yes? Isn't that also unemployment? Unemployment? Oh, well, I... Going every day trying not to commit suicide. I, I am so stubborn that even when I was unemployed, I did not file for it. unemployed for multiple years now. Yeah. Oh. Well, we, you can do the unemployment game, too. I'll let like you have that one. Um, so I called up my grandma. She's 88-ish years, somewhere in there. I think she was 85 at the time. And I was like, I'm so miserable doing this. And she says, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I spent years. I had a business plan that was 50 pages long with financial statements. I had CPAs prepare. That damn thing was 50 pages long. 300 pages of design documentation. She's like, why don't you do that? And he said, oh, I'm an adult. I've got a kid. At the time, my girl was, let's see, how old? Four years ago? So five years old. And, you know, I can't, you've got rent, you've got car payment. These are very real things you're going to have to face, especially since all of you look like you're adults. Um, these are the things you have to decide whether or not you're going to sacrifice very early on in the career. Once you start getting established, especially as Kevin Manning will tell you, you can make a buttload of money from your house if you are a good and dedicated distributed developer. Kevin Manning, without a doubt, I would hire again in a heartbeat for any project I was ever on, no matter how much Don't he even think about it. So, <laughs> but I'm just saying. You were willing to sacrifice your daughter? Just not her, anything but her. Yeah. So, um, so you can make a lot of money as a distributed developer, but it, it, again, it's sacrificing its time. And so she told me that, and I said, no, Went back to work for a few more months. Called her again. Or she called me. She says, what are you doing? And I was like, ah, I'm working. And she says, I'm going to send you some money. And I'm like, Grandma, I'm a grown-ass man. Do not send me any money. And uh, she goes, no, 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 I'm going to send it to you. You're going to start your business. And I'm just like, nope, no, 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 that's not going to happen. She sends me a check for $40,000. And I'm looking at it going, man, <laughs> I could start this company up. I just set it aside. I didn't cash it. She calls me up two weeks later. Why didn't you cash my check? I'm a grown-ass man, Grandma. I'm not going to do that. i got to make my own way in this world. November hits, 2013, and she, says, she starts to try and logic me. And I'm a fairly clever person. And I said, she calls me up and she says, I want you to cash that. And I said, no, I'm not going to take it. She says, well, aren't you trying to raise money? Because she knew I was trying to raise money to start the company on my own. And she says, aren't you going to try and raise money from strangers? And I said, yes, but that's different because I don't have to see them at Christmas. <laughs> and she said, well, what are you trying to do? And my grandmother's a very clever woman as well. And she said, what are you trying to do for these investors? And I said, well, obviously make a successful product, make a profit, get them their money back, make some money for me. And she said, so you won't... Make money for your grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> and so I hemmed and I hawed, and I realized I was miserable at the job that I was doing working for somebody else. I said, all right, I quit my job. I deposited the money. I spent all of 2014 trying to raise the cash. I went from having $40,000 in the bank to 14 months later having $300 in the bank. I went to every single networking event. I went to every single pitch presentation thing. I went to, you name it, if it was a investment anything in this state, I was there listening, learning, pitching, talking. Now that did, years, a couple years later, end up helping me because I've made a lot of connections that have helped us keep moving forward, but I raised zero dollars out of that. So I managed to flush away $40,000 on rent, travel, tickets, like governor's symposium on uh, economic growth, that thing was like $800 just for the ticket, and you had to, you know, hotel night stay and that kind of stuff. And, but always for it, always for it. you got to plan, how are you going to succeed? Because if all you're doing is planning on failing, that is exactly what you're going to do. If you ever get the mentality in your head of this is never going to work, you have just sealed your own fate. I can't stress that enough because, as he had pointed out, morale. Morale is a huge thing. Um, I'm not going to jump ahead in the story, but we'll come back to that. Always keep in your head, no matter how hard it is, 
that you can succeed, you just have to figure out the way to get there. This type of thing, development, entrepreneurialism, is just a Rubik's Cube. How many people here can solve a Rubik's Cube? I would assume there's a couple at least. Yeah, we got a few. You look at it, you got your three by three, there's however many tens of thousands of possible combinations. Realistically, you only need to know the five moves to get it solved. You get the bigger cubes, you get the more combinations, but realistically, you still only have seven to ten moves that you have to know to get it solved. The challenge is learning what those moves are. So, always focus. Caveat to that is do sometimes know when you have to give up, but we're not going to go too deeply into that right now. Um, because that comes into, you want to rapidly prototype and rapidly test. You want to find out if anybody actually wants to play your game. Uh, that was something that I just completely ignored, just assuming that since I know everything, that they would just want to uh, play my game. On the upside, the feedback that we've gotten off of it is, everybody seems to really love the game, and the complaint is, why is nobody playing? So we're trying to tackle that right now by getting ourselves a publisher that can take it global for us. Um, March, March, right, because when did we open? April? March of 2015, I had $300 up in the bank, I had two weeks until my car payment, two weeks until rent was due. You know, I had $1,200, $1,400 worth of bills and $300 in the bank. Sitting at my desk, I've got a, I've got a station, I've got a huge station. I got my desktop, water cooled, you know, all that kind of stuff. I have six monitors, because five is for plebs. So, <laughs> on the one screen we've got, I've got uh, my web browser open for email, I've got Skype over here, Netflix, of course, right front and center, so that way you can pretend that you're working. Resume up right in the main screen. I am literally typing my resume, and I type like this, you got to claw it. Just the resume typing like a velociraptor. And... I get a phone call, and it's one of the investors that had turned me down three, four, five, ten times over the last three years. He says, Scott, what are you working on? Ah, I couldn't get the money. How much do you need? I said, honestly, for what we budgeted, this is also a very valuable lesson. One I didn't fully learn until a few months ago. Make the smallest possible game you can make. I cannot stress that enough. Also, do not make a multiplayer game. So, <laughs> those two lessons right now, and most of you in your head screaming, bullshit, I'm making a multiplayer game, you can't stop me. I wish you the best of luck, but right now that is such a highly oversaturated market, you have to compete with Overwatch, Paladins, Hero Generations. <laughs> you know, you have to complete, compete with... AAA studios make multiplayer games, and they succeed at it because they already have literally millions of customers they can market to. And it's even easier for them, because those customers are already on their Facebook page. They're already following them on Twitter. <coughs> you as an indie have 500 people following you. You need 1,000 people at any hour of the day playing your game, and you've got 500 people following you. They don't just show up, because right now everybody is screaming. This market is so incredibly noisy. Everyone is screaming, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And what ends up happening with this type of thing, it gets just filtered out. Uh, people have a tendency to either, on the market side, look for things that they already know they're going to like, or look for things that the big guys are making. They're not typically looking for the unusual indie that they've never heard of from a company they've never heard of before. So that can help you. Stylizing stuff helped us a lot. Originally, uh, I don't know if you're actually going to be able to see this super well. It's going to be super blurry up here. I apologize for that. Originally, this game and uh, actually, I don't want that image. Uh, we had, uh, I love comic books. I grew up loving comic books, but I like Dark Horse comic books. I love dark and gritty. DC, because Batman is a little grittier. Um, Wolverine was always my favorite because he wasn't afraid to just, you know, was it snicked up into everybody. And so I wanted this game to feel like you were playing a comic book, a grittier comic book hero that was somewhere between pseudo-real and comic booky. And we'd achieved it, but the problem was everybody said it didn't look polished enough, despite the fact that we were specifically going for this look and feel. Super realism from Electronic Arts or Naughty Dog, or any of these, have not necessarily hurt indie. It's not intentional. They're just trying to make a good product or make cash. But you have to realize that if you're in that gray area, if it kind of looks real, but it kind of doesn't, 
you got to stylize it. Because if you don't, people are just going to make the mistake of thinking that you just suck at what you're doing. So, um, I'm also going to make a lot of bold statements. Scott may contradict some of them. Experiences, mileage may vary. I'm going to tell you things from my point of view, how I've lived it over the last several years. He is way more successful than I am right now. I'm hoping to, you know, go down his path, as it were. So originally, let's see if this buffer is enough. Do I not have audio in mind? No, uh, I bet it's not playing through this. Hang on one second. Does, is there speakers connected? You're muted on the video. Oh, are they? A little cross through the speaker. Oh, I'm not, yeah. yeah. I knew that. I was just testing you guys. <laughs> So this is without the filtering. Now, will it help if I turn the light off up front so you can see that a little bit more? Probably. Is that a thing? Right, right there. Yeah. See, I looked, again, hardest possible way. I went anywhere but the shortest distance. <laughs> <laughs> it's all easy once you know how. I don't think this is buffering actually at HD. But so, we created these beautiful environments. We created these interesting characters. We have 30 heroes, each with four unique abilities. One, two, three, four, WSD to move, space for jump, C to crouch. You can change it to a, a semi-first-person shooter mode. Um, we overreached. Now, it's funny because, not in terms of did we do it well, everyone that, right now, again, everyone that is playing seems to really like it. We haven't gotten a lot of trolls go, this is shit, this is shit. Our biggest complaint is, why is there nobody online playing this? And again, that's why we're trying to fuck, you know, we're working to get a publisher right now. Um, so this one, I don't know how you can see it, it's polished from our original style. What ended up happening was, uh, I don't know how many people here know how many people, but uh, has anybody met Kevin in Gracia? Is that name familiar to anybody? Kevin was basically our lead internal character artist. Him and our, our lead engineer decided uh, one day, I was working on a level, they said, let's put a master material on that gives a black outline around everything. And it makes it look, and it's, again, it's not in this, but it makes it look like an upgraded improvement to Borderlands. Because the art is actually really nice and detailed, but nobody liked the fact that it was semi-cartoony. As soon as we put the thick black border on the outside, then it looked, looked intentionally cartoony, and all of a sudden we got all this feedback from people going, holy shit, this is really great, this is really cool, this looks like you're playing in a comic book. Which is what we were going for the whole time. The reason I say don't make a multiplayer game again too is it's really hard to do load, server, balance, bug testing if you have no players, if you don't have an established IP. The other rule that I've read recently, and you should every single night of the week read the news in this industry. Read what other companies are making. Read what's hot. Read what's coming out. That'll give you a clue of some place to start, because if you're trying to do this to be artistic and altruistic and just make good, fun, heartwarming games, you can do that all you want. You won't necessarily make any money off of it. The smarter play is mimic what other people are doing, but with a new spin on it. Try to always be improving. Try to always make something better. Because realistically, if you take a look at MMOs, what's the only MMO that's still surviving for the most part? World of Warcraft. The giant reason behind that is because other games have very simply tried to just copy it. And what we kept seeing at the Cyber Cafe, literally from hundreds to thousands of people, was it was too much like WoW. I already spent two years playing WoW, five years playing I'm WoW. Invested, I'm already invested. I have a max character with max tier gear. All this is is a, a science fiction version of WoW. Now, there are always other bugs and stuff like that. Um, and let me see if uh, Steam... By the way, that looked great. We, we liked how it turned. <laughs> so all that was missing from the polish was a shader. Yeah, a uh, master material 
It's just a black outline, and when we applied it, it applied it to absolutely everything in the game, to all of the rocks, to all the grass, to all the trees, to all the heroes, to absolutely everything, and it gave it a really, 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 really beautiful look. Do you have any screenshots or video of that new... That's what I'm trying to bring up now. Um, Store.steampower.com? Is that what it is? Alright. You know what? I don't know why I'm being such an idiot. I already have it installed on my computer. So let's see, I think these have it on it if I remember correctly. Or it's just, did they not flush the store? No, none of these have it. They're web. Alright, well that showed me something. I don't know how many people have used the Steam backend before. Oh, we got like two. Alright. <laughs> I'm not going to talk shit about Steam because if anyone ever watches this live broadcast, they will probably shut me down and then I won't have a distribution. They are our Lords of Masters after all. They are our Lords of Masters. Thank you, Gavin, for all that you've um, But be aware of something. There's a caveat. Steam doesn't care about you. They will never care about you because there are tens of thousands of you throwing their products at it. The Steam backend is 15 years old. It is hard to use, hard to have. DOS-based. Yeah. Um, we thought that being greenlit on Steam, because we get greenlit in uh, August. Um, jumping forward again, I apologize for that. Ooh, I'm talking. Um, Take your time, man. So, we are going to reverse it just a little bit. And I will show you screenshots of Habit. They are on our Steam page in the game engine, but apparently I didn't hit the flush the front page store button in the Steam backend. So, anyway, there's always a button. You'll we'll find that out. Um, March, I'm sitting there. He's on the phone with me. How much do you need? And I said, we're trying to be this big. And I said, I'm not going to bother doing it for less than $600,000. I said, the reason being is we already, I had already budgeted and worked with a lot of different developers as to how much it was going to cost for, you, you have to figure this model is going to cost me this much money and I need these many models of it. And again, since I tried to do everything the hardest way possible, I didn't make the smallest minimum viable product. I made the largest possible product that I could for the money. Um, and so he goes, okay, I'm in. He says, you've been pitching for years. I know you're, you're, you're doing this thing. Let's do it. Um, rewind a little bit. Back in 2012, I tried to do a Kickstarter. Uh, that failed phenomenally well. If you want to see the world's cringiest Kickstarter, you'll watch ours from 2012. Um, <laughs> At the time, it was just getting off the ground. There was one very successful one. I don't remember which one it was. And so every game designer wannabe decided that they were going to throw it out there. Um, we ended up raising like $8,000 and then pulled the plug on it after 20 days. Uh, the main reason, and this is something you should take home, don't bother with Kickstarter unless you actually have a staff that's shipped a product. Over and over and over again, what you'll find is uh, if you don't have an experienced staff, especially because of how the bigger indies that have abused Kickstarter have made endless numbers of promises and didn't deliver on them. That has burnt all of the goodwill for the game people, the game side of Kickstarter. Not to say you can't be successful, it's just become exceedingly hard mm. because if you have all these No Man's Sky or Star Citizen where they have promised absolutely everything and delivered not what they promised. So keep in mind, if your whole monitor, your whole funding strategy is going to be a successful Kickstarter, man, don't don't stop flipping burgers yet. Um, so we tried that, it failed. He said, yeah, let's do it a few years later. So all of a sudden, I went from having no money to having $600,000. From there, because of all the networking I'd done over the years, I already knew about incentives through the state. We got approved, although this was a struggle as well, it took us about three or four more months, for a $200,000 incentive through the state of Michigan. We ended up getting that. Also, I discovered there's a fifty thousand dollar incentive through the state of Michigan for marketing new tech uh, products. Uh, again, lots of hoops that you have to jump through, and I'll be more than happy. The two hundred thousand dollar incentive thing is gone. That got canceled in 2015. We were the second to last. We were approved five minutes before the closing of it. So, you know, well, it was it was rough. Yeah, um, and that comes back into play in a minute. And uh, the, the $50,000 marketing fund still exists. It's just that thing is uh, get your running shoes on because you've got to run a hot mile and you've got to jump through a million hoops to get it. 
you can get it. It's just, it's rough. Um, but so, raise the money, and all of a sudden I had to start hiring staff. And I was like, this is great, I'm gonna get a bunch of staff. And I started, you know, I'd already been looking at LinkedIn over the last year to see, I've been reaching out to different people, and every developer was, hey, that's great, let me know when you get some cash. Hey, that's great, let me know when you get some cash. I couldn't even put together a prototype, because there was just, no one was willing to. And I don't blame them, because at the end of the day, your time has value. If you get, because you'll see it if you troll the Unity or the Unreal forums, it is an endless number of, I've got the next big thing, I will cut you in on a percentage if you just do six months worth of work for free. <laughs> it sounds funny, but I'm sure most of you have seen it, and it's very, very, very true. So I don't blame them, which is very frustrating for me. The other problem is then what I ran into is the fact that I wanted to hire nothing but Michigan developers, named the game after the seal of the state of Michigan, because every time people said, go somewhere else, I said, no, I'm not going, I'm not going to be part of the problem, I'm going to actually be part of the solution. Uh, that, and I have a daughter, and I wasn't just going to go abandon her and go, you know, 3,000 miles away. Uh, I like my daughter, she's really cool. And um, so we had to hire people, and we had to hire a bunch of college students who had just graduated, I guess they aren't college students anymore. And um, I made the mistake, and again, this is going to be coming all from business CEO side of stuff. These are caveats or warnings or experiences you can possibly learn from. I made the mistake of thinking that because I was so excited and I had this vision that everyone else was going to. Keep in mind when you hire people, they are not your friends. Don't make them be your friends. You're going to do it anyway. Every single one of you are going to, but they are not your goddamn friends. Do not let them be that. You will. I did. <laughs> the main problem becomes then deadlines. We didn't suffer from feature creep. I had already I had done a ton of research into that. I read Gamma Sutra like every day. I read the tech and the blogs and the news every day. Feature creep. Is everyone here familiar with that phrase? Oh yes. yes. The longest journey starts with the words, you know what else would be cool? Yep. <laughs> and I saw a couple people in raise hands. I'm just gonna humor and say tell you what it is. Feature creep is You've got a great idea, let's add this to it, let's add this to it, let's add this to it. So now you've just added another $200,000 worth of features on your $20,000 budget. I was well aware of that, and so I was prepared to scale back, because originally we had 60 girls planned instead of 30. We had 20 maps planned instead of the, the I think we ended up with like 15 now, um, simply because I had time to do it in my spare time. Um, but hiring them, Keep in mind, you're paying them. I mean, if you're not paying them, go ahead and be their friend. That might get a little bit more life out of it. <laughs> but if you're paying them, insist on deadlines, insist on quality of work, because at the end of the day, that money's coming out of your pocket. And it's a tough lesson, and it's a hard lesson, and I don't know, no, maybe two people here are old enough to have ever watched the show Cheers back in the 80s, but I'm basically Sam Malone. I want everybody to be my friend. Now, I learned that lesson. I've moved past it. I'm now a son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I demand that if you're going to tell me you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And I'm not going to pay you if you don't do it. We ran into that a ton. Distributed, I hate it. I admire this man for being able to make multiple projects with Distributed because I absolutely, with the exception of Kevin Manning and Josh Powers, hate Distributed developers because I have been nothing but lied to, cheated out of money, deadlines just come and go, oh, this one you'll hear a bunch. Just load me up with a bunch of work and I'll get it done. It'll all be done in two weeks. It'll all be done in three weeks, two weeks later. Give, give me something. Oh, just keep giving me more. I'm working on it. I'll get it to you. I'll get it all at once. It's a lie. Just fire them right there. You will never see it. Uh, that was six of my 12 distributed developers. Um, so be careful. Don't pay out money until you start seeing some results. Uh, and I hate to have to say that, but that's just the way the world works. Um, especially if you hire global distributed, you're not going to drive over to England and knock on somebody's door and be like, where the hell are my BFX? Um, <laughs> Can I just add an to that? Yeah, please, please, please. And again, this is my experience. No, his, no, no. His main, his, his sound might, may sound a lot happier than this. I was just going to say, you're absolutely right. I would just say, like, I learned that the hard way as well, and I feel like the most important lesson that I've learned is that hiring is, like, the number one 
thing you can do to you know hiring someone who's reliable, look, like looking for those qualities up front will save you a lot of headaches down the road. And yeah, I had to learn that the hard way though with certain yep. people. Yeah. And insist on an art test. We okay. didn't do that early on. I was trying to just anyone that applied pretty much got hired. Yep. And uh, that was when I just started discovering, holy cow, there's a lot more to this than that. Not not, not only not only the quality, I mean we do we do extensive art tests, not only the quality of it, but to make sure that the styles are cognitive yep. are, are consistent. Because if you have stylistic differences, that's gonna be that's gonna be a bad marriage for a long time. If you got somebody that loves anime, only does anime, is and lives and breathes anime. And you ask them to make DC, all they're going to draw is anime. It's not that <laughs> like, like what you want, and it's so true. You have to make sure that their talents match. Plus, always stress: Do you know the tools that I'm using? Have you ever used Unreal? Have you ever used Unity? Have you ever used ZBrush? Have you ever used, you know, Moto or 3ds Max or you name it? Because if that's what you're using for your development. Make sure they know how to, or else you're going to spend so much time explaining it to them. And since they're going to insist on being paid for every hour that you're teaching them, you're basically just doing someone else's job and then paying them to do it for them. So uh, it's harsh. Now, again, if you're just trying to start something up small, you hire some, you know, you work with a bunch of inexperienced people, you're doing like a game jam thing, be nice. That way you can build connections and you can network and you can work on it with something else. But if you're paying them, insist on quality, insist on deadlines. And if they don't make it, do not give them a second chance because if they don't make the first one, they're not going to make the second one. Right. They're not going to make the third. And it's harsh and it's cruel, but this is business. This is your mortgage. This is your car. This is the clothes for your babies. I'm assuming all of you have like 30 babies at this point. Some of you have more babies than these to pound some but, uh, so that was a real hard lesson, and I had to start hiring people, but the upside was is everybody knows somebody. Networking is really good in this industry. So once I'd hired this guy, and this guy, and this guy, then they said, well, oh, I got two buddies that are looking for jobs too, and then they got more, and then we ended up hiring a really good crew. I did end up having to, over the first year, I cycled through about 30% of our staff through firings, simply because either they couldn't do what they said they could do, and that's a hard one, saying to somebody, you're not actually good enough, because that's their dream still, is to be an animator or a modeler or whatever. But at the end of the day, you've got to get that product shipped. So we hired. We had planned on one year, $600,000. Nah, budgeted around uh, 14 months, we thought. Well, at eight months, we had one of our maps half done. And we had eight of our 30 heroes mostly done. And so we were now we are basically just scratching alpha land. And it was multiplayer, it is multiplayer only, and so I had to make some real hard decisions. But luckily, since I've had the time end network, I was able to go out, reach out, find additional money. The state money, that two hundred grand that sounded real good, doesn't didn't pay out until we had shipped the product. It was an incentive for spending the cash and keeping the business in Michigan. Now, the MEDC is fantastic. If you guys are not familiar with the MEDC, look it up. They got incentives, they got connections, they know everybody that knows everybody. As this industry continues to grow and the old guard gets shoved out, unfortunately, I don't mean this as an insult to anybody older than me in this room. <coughs> the people with money in this state are old white men that worked in automotive, energy, or healthcare. And you know what they invest in? Go ahead, take a guess. Automotive, energy, and healthcare. Because if you have all this money and you want to make more, are you going to invest in something you've never, ever, ever had any experience in? Of course not. Now, that is going to be replaced over time, but God, that could be a decade from now. You know, as, as that's, that's why we're, we're here. That's why the, this has been formed. That's why it's under the wing of, of Spark. Yeah. That's why. And it's rough because I've been turned down by Spark multiple times for investment. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to keep asking, because if you don't ask, the answer is no. If you do ask, the answer will still be no, but at least then you've made a network connection. Um, so I ended up raising, uh, well, we clocked in at an additional one million, um, because the guy believed the product was going to be good enough. And we were seeing, you know, early tests were coming up like we wanted, the problem was is just we weren't far enough ahead. And so he greenlit, he said, whatever you need, go ahead. So we kept all the staff on. We ended up hiring some additional ones. Uh, we had a few opportunities. We worked with Michigan State University. We hired a PhD. 
contracted with them at an artificial intelligence system. We're going to revolutionize gaming artificial intelligence, and by God, someday I still will. Um, unfortunately, when you work with very large institutions like that, they're not looking out for your interest. They're, they will help you, but your goals are not theirs. And so we didn't quite get the support that we thought we were going to. And in order to finish that AI, I would have had to derail all of the engineering off of the actual product. So I thought, all right, we're going to shelve AI for right now, get our product out there, get some revenues going, and then we can jump back onto the AI. It's actually really cool. It's a, it's a learning, it's a true learning AI. It's not an expert system or a branch tree like you'll actually see in these engines. It keeps track of all the player actions, all the NPC actions, and basically a glorified neural network database. But the way it prunes, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter over time. We were actually seeing, after the first couple of months of tests, that the AI, AI without any instructions from us, had started to fight back, which is really exciting to see. But then we had to drop. So maybe someday there'll be a middleware you'll buy from us that, that has this takeover. Can you sell that to Blizzard for use in Heroes of the Storm? <laughs> <laughs> we had big plans for that AI, and we still do. So someday I'm going to take it off that shelf, and we're going to just put it back into play. Um, but it does require me actually exiting this IP, or you know, successfully getting revenue off this IP. Um, another year goes by. Well, not a year. About six, seven more months go by. Um, we had done some really great things. The product still wasn't shipped or wasn't shippable. It was late alpha at best. We had just gotten into Steam Greenlight. We thought, okay, we're on Steam. We got approved. Steam has, what is it, 152 million annual users. We thought there's no way this is going to go bad. We're going to show them. They're going to love this. Uh, in Steam Early Access, Steam does not promote your game at all. The only reason it will is if you already have sales. Of it. So, actually, uh, I and several other people I know tend to stay away from Steam early access when we see it in the queue or whatever. It is, and that's, you know, that's become a problem because ideally early access should be used to discover bugs and make the product better. And that was what we were doing with it. The problem is, is most cash grab indies did early access, did never finish the product. And so for us, it is... I wouldn't say it's hurt us, it just hasn't helped us. And the fact that we didn't realize going into it that you get no publicity while in early access, unless you already have sales, all of a sudden those millions of people we thought were going to at least be testing it for free, there's just nobody there. So um, now you have the challenge of how do we market this product when we had no money to begin with to market it. And so hardest thing that I've ever had to do was lay off 25 people on one Sunday night, because I couldn't get the state to pay out the cash. It was, God, that was the end of September, wasn't it? 2016? I had really good people working for me. By that point, the team was just firing on all cylinders. Everyone was working well together. Everything was coming together real well. But we ran out of money. And so I knew I had enough for about two and a half, three months if I cycled down to about five people. So I laid 20 of them off. Now, over the course of this whole thing, we had 54 people working on it from concept art, music, distributed that, distributed this. So we had a lot of people touch the product. And it, it's actually quite fun. I, I, I would love for everyone in this room to be able to play. And anyone that gives us their email or business card will give you a free key. Because realistically, I want people to play it and tell their friends and love it. Because I don't need the cash for it right now. I need players playing it and telling other people. So um, anyone that wants to. Free game key for Playboard, you just get in touch with me or Emily, um, and we'll give it to you. Two months go by, two and a half, three months go by, I've got one engineer, I've got Emily, I've got one art guy, and myself, and then a QA guy. And actually, I think Larry knows half of my staff. There was Ray Bartos and uh, Kevin Manning, his contract was actually up a couple months earlier, so um, uh, he had already gone on to, I think, he was working on System Shock at that point. Um, but I don't know if you guys know like Kevin Gracia or Matt Grachak or um, Dylan Somerville, Stephen Lakota. Lakota. All these people, a lot of them came from CCS in Detroit. Any CCSers here? We got one. All right, well, that's good. Where is most of you folks coming from? Ann Arbor, Ipsy, 
Cincinnati, Cincinnati oh, yeah. Grand Rapids, Detroit, and our yeah. I'm not from CCS, but I'm friends with Blaine. Gotcha. Well, <laughs> the nice thing was because these guys were all very talented and very determined to do game development. Yes, they wanted Quavo to succeed. We all did. We all do. Hell, I, I obviously very much still do. Um, a great number of them have actually gone on and been hired by AAA or I don't know what AAA indie, if that would be counted. But like Dylan is now working on Telltale, working on Batman. And uh, Steven is working uh, audio over at uh, Rocket League. And uh, Zach is working on Paladins. He's making, I don't know if you guys play Paladins, but our guy who's just with us for two years is now Doing heroes and skins. Where, where, where did Ray go to? Ray just moved here. Ray just moved out to uh, LA, didn't he? San Diego. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Josh Powers, uh, he's been doing stuff for Halo. He's a distributed guy. He's been he'd been doing stuff for all sorts of big ones. And oh, who was it? Uh, 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 Dan. Dan Moore, animator from I think was it in Ypsilanti? Didn't he live over here? He was living in Westland. He was at uh, he's at Westland place now. Uh, yeah, Call of Duty. He ended stuff. up going to work at Call of Duty, and so our talent was not bad talent. It was just the lesson you need to take away from this was start small, get a title, build a fan base. Um, so laid off everybody, have a few people left. We're trying desperately to get it to a shippable state. There's still lots of bugs that we're working out. There's some balance that we're working out. Animations, our number one complaint was the animations were real wooden and stiffy. And stiffy. Wooden and stiff. It's all right, it's late. We're, we're, we're good. And uh, it's all adults here, right? And uh, so, luckily for me, Kevin Gracia, not only a talented 3D character modeler and concept artist, but also an extremely talented animator, uh, came in and stepped in after I'd laid off our other animator, and he cleaned absolutely everything up. So, I mean, it's a team. It's a pipeline. It's, you get one guy to start, you get another guy to clean it up. Sometimes it's the same guy. Either way, uh, the big thing, don't get butt hurt if somebody makes yours better. Uh, just be happy that the product at the end of the day is good, because it's a collaboration. You know, if you're an artist, you didn't code everything, so you're not going to be upset when someone makes really good code on your art. Why would you be upset if someone arts your art a little bit? Um, so, you know, uh, ego is a huge thing problem in this industry because everybody knows absolutely everything about everything. And uh, I've you've eaten uh, my fair share of humble pie in the last year and a half. So I'm very stubborn and started calling around how the hell do we get this money. Technically we classified it as shipped because it was an early access, but then we thought, all right, the state's going to pay out that 200 grand. We can finish this thing up. And the state goes, no, you have to have it independently audited, all your books. Okay, fair enough. You know, we get that. State's not just going to hand me a check for a quarter million dollars. None of the auditors will do it. Oh, yeah, we don't do that for the state. Months go by. The auditors, or well, weeks go by. The auditors that they recommend, oh, we don't do that anymore. So I'm now talking to senators. I'm talking to the CEO of MEDC. I'm talking to anyone. And... You know, I can burn a bridge like nobody's business. I just, because at the end of the day, I've got to look at it of what's it going to take to get this done? I'm not looking to make friends, I'm looking to finish something. He put it on there, ship a product. Half a dozen times? Maybe it was just two, but it's just for me, it was like half a dozen. Because it was very important. Ship that goddamn product. You cannot make money off of it, you cannot start working on another, you cannot show people what you've done if it's still sitting in limbo and nobody knows where it's at. Ship that product. So I do what I did. I did what I do best. I piss people off, and I called everyone's superiors. And finally, the squeaky wheel got noticed, and they said, "All right, hire this firm." The firm says, "We'll do it." Paid them thousands of dollars to audit it. They got it done. I sent it over to MEDC, and MEDC says, "Sorry, this branch has been unfunded for a year and a half. There's nobody to check it." <laughs> Luckily, the people at the MEDC that were still working, they have no more incentives to give, but there's still people working. And the people that are working there are wonderful, amazing people. And uh, they said, all right, Scott, let's see what we can do. 
got the senator involved. He made phone calls. I mean, you know, I don't get starstruck, but calling up a senator and be like, help us. And him going, I will help you. It was really great. <laughs> uh, because it was really what you want to see, what you want to feel like your government is actually doing, you know, your state, your, the, the things you're paying into. That's what you want to feel like. And he stepped up. Uh, I don't know. I don't, he couldn't help any of you at this point, I don't think. But, uh, you know, I want to give a shout out to Senator Curtis Fertel, Jr. He has been an absolute godsend. He has helped us because he says, you hired the people. You paid all that money for salaries. You did everything that you were supposed to do, and now you're being screwed out of the money. Now, those weren't his exact words. He's way more smarter. PC. I'm going to go with more smarter. Technically. Yeah, I can explain it. You just wouldn't get it. So, um, so at any rate, uh, he gets involved. Next thing you know, the MEDC says, all right, we're just going to send this over to the Treasury. They can deal with it. The Treasury said, oh, this looks good. It has a check. Now, that was after two and a half months, wasn't it? December, January, half of February, uh, where none of us got paid. Everybody showed up at the office. <laughs> now, how I convinced the last people to do that, oh, that's, that's a miracle. <laughs> but they stuck with it, and at the end, as soon as that check was cashed, everybody got all their back pay. And because uh, the last thing I'm going to do, although I've been screwed over and over and over again, I'm not going to do that to anybody else. Um, I don't like being a hypocrite. I'll be a jerk if you want. That's fine. I will not be a hypocrite. And um, so we got to pay. And what we've been doing over the last several months is we have been seeing more traction. We've been doing daily streams. We've been using Discord to grow our audience. We've been reaching out to try and work with streamers. I've actually reached out to marketing firms outside of us to pay them to help gospel, but the big challenge we keep running into is this product is very similar. It's like a bastardization between Overwatch and League of Legends. And since both of those already have a massive audience that are just playing a game like that, uh, it is kind of hurting us because they don't want to give up the valuable Overwatch time to play an unknown indie. Now, if we had um, you know, a market already, of course they would play it. Uh, again, it keeps coming down to everybody seems to like it. They just don't know where the customers are. And that's my current business challenge is how do we get to the last step? Because I'm ready to ship. We are now putting polish on stuff just to make it a tiny bit shinier. Um, localization. We've just uh, used Unreal. We've got a wonderful system where every language under the sun, I kind of went overworked a little bit. Uh, I don't know if Swahili is a big country for action, third-person, multiplayer games. It might be. You never know. You know, Steam tells you it's like Russia, Russian, English, Spanish, Portuguese. Brazil is very big on gaming. Uh, German. I don't remember what the last name was. Prefix, French. Yeah, French. Yep. And so it's just little things to make us more attractive. You know, we're trying to talk to 2K. They said we love games at scale and are global. Um, that's exactly what we've got. Uh, what about Asia? Say again? What about Asia? The Tencent. Yeah, we've got them. And Tencent, yeah. Um, realistically, I don't have the knowledge, because I already know there's a lot of regulations and rules in getting into China and into you Asia. Want, you, want have, you want to have Tencent handle Yeah. You would not be able to show that skull thing there. But I've been told that, yeah, like in League of Legends, they had Karthus. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever played League. Anyone? Yeah. Like crap. It's like the world's most popular game. There's four people in the room that have played it. No, no, I played that. Carthus has is a skeleton, and in the U.S. version, you can see his face. It's just a skull. But in uh, China, because it's taboo, apparently the hood covers his it's face. It's too spooky. Yeah. So, um, well, we could change it because this game was actually called Skull Ball. It was uh, the game itself is a combination of four game modes. It's all multiplayer. 30 heroes, you can customize all their stats, their run speed, their jump height, their cooldowns, their damage, their shields, their resistances. We have a very robust system in place because one of the things I loved as a designer was playing World of Warcraft and I raided. I raided the shit out of everything in uh, Burning Crusade and Wrath and Cataclysm and then I was like, ah, I'm done with this. And I played EVE Online. You guys, anyone familiar with EVE Online? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the spreadsheet simulator. And I have the also best. The, uh Simulator yeah. of those who have destroy everyone yep. who wants. And so I have a spreadsheet that you guys would love to get your hands on if you still played it for every market fluctuation on pricing and profit and 
cubic meters to put it in your cargo hold and how many jumps to get there and how much time based on your speed. I love spreadsheets. So min-maxing was a big thing for me and so I threw that, I put that into this game by design and now we're backing it out a little bit because we've discovered that the average gamer 15 to 18 years old, they just want to face roll all over the keyboard, right? And so although stats are fun, when you have too many of them, it just, it's like, I don't know what's the difference between this one and this one and this one. And so we're backing out, originally we had four damage types, we're backing it down basically to two, et cetera, and so forth. And just to simplify, big lesson there. If you have any friends that are not gamers, ask them to play your game while it's in beta. Yeah. And if they don't understand it, make it so they do understand it. Not by telling them, but go on, just... Sit and watch play. If they, and whatever they get frustrated over and I don't get it, change that. Because you're, you cannot risk your audience stopping playing because they don't understand what they're doing. So um, our four game modes are Death and Glory. I was a big fan of Warhammer 40K. Dawn of War 2 had Death and Glory mode in it. Or I think it's called Last Stand. So we rebranded as Death and Glory. It's a six player multiplayer PvE. There are 18 waves that get harder and harder and harder and every five waves is a boss. I wanted to add some of that raid play into it. We've got two of those maps. Those are really hard to balance, by the way. Um, especially if you have 30 heroes, all with varying stats. Trying to discover what's too hard, just hard enough, not blah, blah. Then we have uh, Team Deathmatch. Uh, we call Team Annihilation. That's a 9v9. Beautiful scenarios that they're in. We've got this lovely new Detroit again. I love Michigan. Been here, uh, you know. And so we, we envision what if... Detroit was ripped out of the ground and floating in the sky with the buildings all around everywhere. And we made Hologram Park, and in Hologram Park, Joe Louis' fist is a hologram. We've got um, the other one. Oh, Spirit, Spirit of Detroit. Detroit. I don't know which hand he, he holds it in. Um, so a lot of homages to this state. But uh, so Team Deathmatch, Death and Glory, um, Skullball, which our developers were huge into Rocket League when we were making it. I had always wanted to add an eSport element to the game, and this was just a natural progression. We had all the assets, and we were just like, let's see what we can do out of it. And so it's kind of like Rocket League, but with heroes. And it ended up being way more fun than we'd ever thought, because it's not just about knocking the ball into the goal. It's about just murdering your opponents, so that way they can't knock the ball. And there's a lot of like mini meta going on inside of it, because a lot of our heroes can go invisible or change places with you. And since all of our maps are a little bit Smash Brothers-ish, where you can teleport them off into lava, it's just super fun that we didn't actually envision going to happen. It was an accidental fun. And then the fourth one, I'm blanking here. CTC. Capture the core. Uh, going back to World of Warcraft, I loved Arathi Base and that kind of stuff where you would have to capture objectives to get tickets. It's a proven game model. Call of Duty does it, Battlefield does it. And so that's, again, in our third person where you have to capture locations and power up uh, a reactor core. And if you find the randomly spawned glowing one and take it back, you get bonus tickets. Um, all of them have been very well received. Uh, it's The idea was give everybody a game that there's something for everybody in. Again, in retrospect, I wish I would have just made Skullball the game capture the core of the game, you know, make each one of them at 499 because uh, when you go into monetization, you have to look at value proposition. You have to look at what your budget was. You know, if you, we, I would never want to sell this at $1.99 because then we'd have to sell literally 1 million units just to break even, and that's without steam tape. So we'd have to sell a million and a half units just to even break even. So you have to look at what was my budget, how much do I have to sell to break even, how much do I have to sell to make a profit, how much do I have to sell to make the next project. Um, so free to play is a little different if you start having to figure out selling perks, doing ads, that kind of stuff. We originally were going to do free to play, but when we were released with that, it was universally reviled. Everyone that played it said, I don't want to fucking do that. So just give it to us for whatever, 20, 25 bucks. If you take a look, there's more things you can do in this than player unknowns battlegrounds, and they're selling for 30 bucks, but they're in known quantity because they have a big name attached. Nobody cares paying 30 bucks as long, since they know they'll always be able to play it with people. But right now, I set ours at $24.99 because I had to look at knowing people buy games pretty much only when they're on sale. 
we had to look at if I started it in 1999, I got to put it on sale for ten bucks. I always, I always tell people that, that you can always you can always discount. You can always go lower. Yeah. So when you're planning on what your price is, make it higher so that way the price you need to hit is your sale price because that's what people are realistically going to buy. At. Um, short of that. Uh, the last little bit that I'll get into, and I, I do apologize, no, I, I talk long. I love to talk, I love this industry. Um, there is a lot of bitterness, there is a lot of backstabbing stuff, but at the end of the day, it's going to be what you make out of it. So if you let that stuff get to you, you're going to be a bitter, broken person. Whereas if you just kind of figure out how do we improve and move forward, then things will be okay. But um, while we've got the last stretch, pretty much tubers, is polished. We are doing still bug testing and tweaking a little bit. We realized that most of the people that watch Emily's stream, we've been playing lots of different games in the afternoon, uh, tune in for horror VR. I want to touch on this a little bit. Um, Scott had mentioned, you know, you don't want to just make the same thing everybody else is making. The only caveat to that is um, research what everybody else is doing because it gives you an indicator of where the games industry is going. And especially if you look at what's coming out a year or two from now, that gives you an idea because the big companies, the triple A's, they've got millions of dollars they're spending on market research to see where it's going and what, you know, what's going to happen. Even failed games for triple A's make profit. Age of Conan was a, uh, they ended up spending years like 60 million on development on it and they still sell 3 million units at 60 bucks a piece. You know, so they got $180 million off a $60 million investment on a failed game. So follow what the big guys are doing, get an idea of where the industry is going. Do do your own thing. I, I'm a big fan of seeing new stuff. Everyone's a big fan of seeing new stuff because everyone's bored. Honestly, the games industry is a little boring right now outside of VR because you're seeing a lot of exactly the same title out there. But we found that people tuned in for horror v or horror games more than anything else, and I realized that I already had all the assets I needed, and many of our multiplayer levels would be perfect horror jump scare levels. And for some reason we've discovered people like the way our game looks better in first person than in third. And I don't know if it's, I mean, literally you're not seeing any different asset, it's just they like it better in first person. And so he had said, you know, two weeks. That's amusing because we had just budgeted two weeks to do this. But the thing was is, all the levels are already made. All the characters are already made. Realistically, we're shoveling all of our controls out and turning it into movement and two abilities. And I'm now excited because I love doing lighting on maps. I don't know why, I must hate myself. Um, but it's a lot of fun being able to play with the lighting to give it ambiance and mood and atmosphere and that kind of stuff. And so we're going to package that up, and now that there's no Steam Greenlight, I don't know if you guys knew this, Steam is only 100 bucks, and you put your game on there. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking for platforms, you don't have to avoid Steam. Um, just keep in yeah. mind they're not necessarily... The, the, problem, the problem is discovery. Is discovery, yeah, is what you're on there. So you can look at that like Humble Bundle, or GOG, or Green Man Gaming, or PCGame.com, or whatever. It's just another place that you can sell and get discovery because a lot of times we, we found people didn't want to buy the game from our website. They didn't want to click that shopping cart, but they had no problem doing it in Steam. Mm -hmm. So it does legitimize you like you're not just screwing somebody out of some cash. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited. We've actually been busting our butts over the last couple of days to get this, bought this fun blood, pla blood pack off the marketplace. Some really cool zombies that when we applied physics to them, it was accidental because the animator had put a full anime set on it, and so they sit there with the back against the wall, put on the ground, and they kind of just look around like this, right? Now you can get them stand up and whatnot, but I gave them physics, and so they crumple onto the floor, but the animation's still playing, so it's dragging their body around. <laughs> Not intentionally, but it's just this random drag, and it made this really creepy, really cool. Emily hates it. She's going to bury it for me. Uh, so my goal is to make Emily crap herself at the end of the next two weeks just from jump scares and zombies and shit like that. Um, so this is a long road. Uh, I hope that what I've said tonight gives you some insight on this. Um, there are a lot of jobs out there. You have to apply. There is a lot of people already applying. If you are mediocre at what you do, you'll get a mediocre job. If you put the extra time in, you will get the top tier jobs. You know, these guys that worked for me, 
they didn't just phone it in for two years, they busted their ass, and that's why they got picked up by the bigger companies. Um, so just keep trying, do learn the tools. If you're trying to be hired by a big AAA, every one of them posts their uh, career pages on, and there's always something for every department. Look at the tools that they're using. You know, if they say that they're just doing C++, don't walk in there going, I did Unity. They don't care. I'm not going to hire you, I'm going to go hire the guy that knew it. If they say they're just using Unity, don't go in there, and you can, you know, still say you've got a skill set, but make sure that you've got the one that they're hiring from, because they're not going to be like me. They're not going to give you three months of, oh, keep trying. They're going to give you two weeks of, you didn't do it, you're fired. So if you want to actually know how to get a job at the AAAs, go to their website, look what they require, and know it. Um, short of that, do a quick QA. Um, and like I said, I would love to show off more of the game. I'm not just a big fan of the projector lighting or whatever. Everyone here who wants one will get a Steam key. Yeah. Um, and if you've got friends that want them, we will hand them out. Uh, I had to fight with Steam to give me the game keys because they said, well, no, you haven't had a lot of interest in early access, so we're not going to give you game keys. <laughs> Literally generating a spreadsheet with numbers on it. Uh, <laughs> so um, we ended up getting a boatload of game keys, and we've just been handing them out, getting people to play. And again, it's over and over again. Lots of fun. Where are the players? So can, can we all can we all commit to to, to to helping him out on this? Can we all commit to? I mean, come on. Ask me to play games isn't the. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is PC only. We actually are in talks right now with Nintendo to get on the Switch because it should work beautifully on that. Um, we did get certified with Sony and, and Microsoft for Xbox and PlayStation. Unfortunately, I don't have enough devs to actually QA QC. So, um, if anybody is a big... And there's, there's a whole long process. And there's, it's a oh, yeah. several month process to get through um, a lot of that. A lot, a lot of that. But, uh, so at any rate, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to 